it's not the seizures that affect things like morbidity and mortality, right? It's actually things like dementia and stroke that are the bigger causes of that. Fellow Homo sapiens, in this week's Epilepsy Sports Insights podcast, we hear about how to minimize one's risk of dementia from adult neurologist and neuroscientist Alice Lapp. As learned in last week's um, episode, people with an epilepsy are two to three times more likely to develop dementia. So it's crucial that patients plan how to and do do their best to preserve their brain function. Hi, I'm Alice Lamb. I'm a neurologist and neuroscientist at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Do you have um, patients ever bringing any fears or concerns about getting older um, and dementia in addition to epilepsy or vice versa? Does that ever come up in conversation? Definitely. Um, you know, again, it happens across all, all ages. Um, and it's not always that it's concerned about dementia, but, but obviously that is a concern that a lot of people have, especially as they get older. Um, but memory problems, you know, it's one of the most common um, concerns of people who have epilepsy. Um, it's, it's just that as people get older, we start to think about other potential causes of memory problems, things like dementia, things like Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of neurodegenerative diseases. Say I'm a patient and I say, look, I'm really worried that I might be developing some form of dementia and my memory is getting worse and say I'm, I don't, I don't know what would be an age to say I'm 65, 70 years old. What would you be looking into as far as the patient's concerned to try and assess things? Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of things, actually, because there's a lot of things <laughs> that can cause um, memory to, to get worse. Um, so, you know, the big thing that's always on their mind, right, especially if they're in that age group is, do I have something like Alzheimer's disease, right? But it's not always, that's not always what it is, right? So, you know, I think about things like, you know, how um, well or not well controlled are their seizures, right? What medications are they on? As people get older, we know that, um, you know, your metabolism changes. And so if you haven't had your, you know, seizure medication levels checked in a while, they may be a lot higher than they were in the past. So, so those can change oh. with time. And, and sometimes we have to, you know, reduce doses to, to kind of... Um, make it's like a sleep. slowing metabolism can actually reduce, oh, oh sorry, increase absorption rate? Is that kind of what you're implying or? Um, it, it can reduce how the medicine's cleared from your system oh, so that okay. the medicine has, can build up more and your levels would actually end up going, going up. So that's something. Um, I often ask about sleep. Another really important one, especially as people get older, you know, a lot of people aren't sleeping as well. They may be getting up multiple times in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, you know, things like that as, mm -hmm. as, it happens as people get older and or something that you know we can there's ways to address those that that aren't necessarily related to, to epilepsy um things like mood as well definitely play a role in um in how people function cognitively and so ask about that so there's a lot of things that that you know i'll sort of ask about and try to get into and, and understand but if a lot of those things, you know, come out like, you know, I'm sleeping really well, my mood is great, my epilepsy has been controlled for a long time, you know, my medications are all fine, then I do start to wonder about something like, uh, you know, like Alzheimer's disease or some other kind of neurodegenerative disease. And, and in that case, I, you know, we're thinking about cognitive testing and more detailed cognitive testing, repeating things like a brain MRI to see how what the brain looks like um, and other kinds of work up to, to better get at, you know, some of these other diseases uh, such as Alzheimer's disease. And how do you say, say to somebody that, okay, do you know what? We are a bit concerned that this could potentially be Alzheimer's, but we don't know, you know, let's look into this. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's sort of like an elephant in the room, right? Because that's right. when they're coming to you with that, that's on, that's basically what, their, what's on their mind, right? And so, in some ways, you know, not addressing that or not 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 kind of addressing that head on, you know, or not saying that it's a potential possibility. It again, it depends on each patient and and how they're adapting and how they're kind of thinking about things. But but I'd say that when when I have patients who are often older and who are coming in with memory concerns, that's on a lot of people's minds, right? They might tell me, you know, I took care of my mom who had Alzheimer's disease and I'm worried that this is happening to me too, you know, because at that point they've had experience with parents getting older as well. And 
um, or seeing other people, um, you know, dealing with with those kinds of diseases. And so um, I'd say a lot of times that's that's what's on their mind. Do you, you know, from what you've just been saying, like, oh, you know, how good is your sleep? You make me think of somebody I know who's going through perimenopause and it's changed her sleeping pattern completely. She doesn't have epilepsy, but I can just imagine if she did, that could so affect her cognitive function, maybe her seizures, maybe not. But um, and then so say somebody, you know, you um, you got divorced that would stress you out and the stress alone, but plus potentially the effect on your, you know, on your sleep and stress levels that could affect it. Right. Or, um, I was reading this article about, and I think more people should talk about this. It's crazy that we don't as a species is, um, how, uh, I can't remember the term for it, but when you have limited control over your bladder, especially after, for instance, when you've just had a child, that is really common, then you have to get up all the time and that interrupts your sleep and causes you stress and upset. And again, that could impact your epilepsy or cognitive function. No, I mean, that happens as people get older, right? Men who have prostate right, that, yeah. issues, right? Some of them tell me they get up, you know, three, four times in the middle of the night, which means that they're, you know, getting like an hour of sleep, waking up, getting an hour of sleep, you know, and that can really affect your thinking during the day. Well, sleep apnea as well, actually. That's another one, right? That is a really important one too, because your risk for that increases as you get older as, as well. So these are all the kinds of things, you know, it, it, it requires asking a lot of questions and really getting into sort of everything that's going on in, in this person's life and trying to, trying to understand that. Um, but I think that there's often, you know, things that we can do to at least try to optimize what's going on, right, in terms of, you know, addressing issues that might be causing poor sleep, um, addressing mood issues, right? Um, things like that. Sometimes I'll even do an EEG, you know, an, an overnight EEG on, on patients um, to see if, you know, we talked about this epileptiform activity, right, that, that we can see. Sometimes even if their seizures are controlled, I kind of want to get a sense of are they having a lot of spiking during sleep that we don't know about because, you know, again, depending on what kind of epilepsy they have, that kind of spiking may, you know, if it affects their temporal lobes, that can certainly be associated with um, memory issues. And, and so we might consider adjusting medications depending on what we see, things like that. So I guess really important to recognize is that epilepsy can change over time, as can your overall health, right? It doesn't remain, well, I would say we're quite unstable creatures really, right? And so things will change basically. Um, likely anyway, as you get older. Yeah. And, you know, there are normal changes that happen as people, as people get older and, and, and those things can certainly affect, um, our thinking and epilepsy and, and other aspects of our health in ways that can make us not function as well cognitively as we have been in, in the past. It's ultra interesting. And I could say from a patient perspective, not knowing is one of the worst things like or having these suspicions in your head like oh it could be this it could be that and i t totally understand why people would think that yeah but i guess where possible it's best to see your clinician about these things even if it's just over the phone like lots of i don't know about um your side of the pond but we have lots of our uh, calls with um epilepsy nurses over here so we don't even sometimes need to go into the hospital we just say by the way this is going on what do you think yeah you know there's definitely communication through um, through sort of web portal and, and we've been doing you know, a lot of what we call virtual visits. So, so almost like this, you know, a video visit, um, for, for patients as well. Um, but you know, something like a memory concern, I, I do think it, it warrants, uh, you know, an appointment to discuss because there's just so many different things that, that need to be assessed and need to be thought about that, you know, again, if you're someone who thinks you might have, have memory problems or you're worried about that, it's worth addressing and it's worth addre making sure, you know, you're addressing it um, fully. Epilepsy is not just about seizures. And I think we still need to convince a few clinicians of that as well. Um, yeah. It is many other things which contribute to quality of life or lack thereof, which need to be addressed, I think. Yeah. I'll say that's especially true, you know, so when we think about like the, who develops epilepsy, right? There, it's a U-shaped curve. I don't know if you've seen yeah. this, this graph, yes. right? So it's yeah. very young people are very prone or have a high risk of developing epilepsy. And then, and then as people get older, your risk of developing epilepsy goes up as well. And so that's another thing that we, we've been interested in studying. Um, and we're trying to put together just a, a larger study to, to be able to look at this. But, but people who um, develop what we call late onset epilepsy. So, you know, over the age of let's say 60 or 65, develop seizures out of the blue. And there's a lot of people who will develop seizures kind of out of the blue at older ages 
where it's really not clear what caused their seizure, right? It's not, they don't have a stroke, they don't have a brain tumor. You know, how did they get through so much of life and then all of a sudden develop epilepsy late in life? We, we don't know the answers to that. Um, but we do know that, you know, even when you develop seizures late in life, it tends, for most people, it tends not to be a, what, what I think of as like a more aggressive or poorly controlled epilepsy. It tends to be, you know, once you're on a seizure medicine, many of these, many of these people can be seizure free. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, there have been studies that look at kind of outcomes in this, in this specific group of people. And um, it's not the seizures that affect things like morbidity and mortality, right? It's actually things like dementia and stroke that are the bigger causes of that. So that's an I think a perfect example of kind of what you're talking about, Tori, in terms of it's not, seizures may not be everything, right? Because you can have someone where their seizures are well controlled, but if you're only thinking about seizures, you're gonna be missing the bigger picture in terms of what might actually affect this person down the line in terms of their risk for you know, dementia, their risk for stroke. And, and we should be thinking about, you know, how do we prevent these things or how do we reduce risk for these things in, in people who are, who are at risk for that. And just as a positive uh, or hopefully constructive ending, what are some simple things that people with an epilepsy can do to minimize their risk of some dementias, if anything? Let me broaden that and, and, and even just make it not epilepsy specific, because there are recommendations that uh, a lot of large medical groups have, have made in terms of things that, you know, advice that, that, that can help um, sort of reduce risk for developing dementia. And most of these things are, are not, you know, they're not like secrets or surprises in any way, right? They're very simple life, lifestyle things, you know, that you can do. Um, so one Im important thing is, um, you know, exercising, right? Um, getting regular aerobic exercise. Another one is diet, right? Eating sort of a heart healthy diet. And again, I'm not saying, you know, these are choices that you make over time. It's not something like, all right, now I have to go out and be on the strictest diet. I'm not allowed to have any sweets and I'm not allowed to enjoy it. Like, that's not what I'm saying. We want to live, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's not what I'm saying, right? I agree. Life is about living. Um, but being aware of the choices that you're making, you know, over time and, um, and, and, and even just having that awareness that that can make a difference over time, it, I think is important, right? Um, there are other things like, um, you know, for people who are, who are younger and who are like going through school and things like that. So, you know, the amount of education that you get is actually protective against something like dementia down the line. I hadn't heard that. I wondered that, but why is that? We don't know yet. Um, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure. Um, part of it may have to do with this idea of um, cognitive reserve. So basically this idea is that, you know, we, we start at a certain level of, of cognitive function, right? And let's say you have a neurodegenerative disease. Let's say your brain is starting to develop, you know, the changes that occur in someone with Alzheimer's disease. If you're starting at a high level of cognitive reserve, um, you can actually tolerate a lot more. The idea is that you can tolerate more of these, you know, pathologic changes that are going on in your brain before you start to lose function, before you lose your ability to pay your bills or, you know, things like that, right? Whereas if you're starting at sort of a lower level of cognitive reserve, then, you know, you may be affected sooner by the disease in terms of, you know, losing, losing your day-to-day -day functions and things like that. So read, do your crosswords and exercise your brain as well as your physical body. So those are kind of the three pillars of brain health that I, that I tell, you know, all my patients is that, you know, diet, exercise, and staying mentally and socially active um, are, are really important for brain health as, as we're aging. Um, but things like, you know, the things that are more specific to people with epilepsy, uh, certainly I think that the social interaction part for someone with epilepsy can be really important because, you know, a lot of people are more isolated or they feel like they can't go out or, or, or they, they may have limitations in how much they can go out based on, based on their epilepsy. But trying to find ways to, to, you know, get social interaction, I think is important to think about. 
Um, same goes with exercise for a lot of people who have epilepsy, right? Um, that a lot of people tend to be a little bit more um, sedentary in, in terms of their lifestyle and that may be related to epilepsy, medications, other, other, other facets. Um, head injuries is another important one, right? Um, so obviously, you know, there's people who have convulsive seizures who have had a number of head injuries as, as they fall, things like that. But then, you know, thinking about, okay, I'm, I may not have a ton of control over, over, you know, when I have a seizure and I may not be able to prevent that, but can I prevent other kinds of head injuries, right? So wearing bicycle helmets, wearing seatbelts, things like, you know, kind of obvious things like that, right? Or avoiding other situations where you're going to be hitting your, you know, maybe avoiding sports where, you know, your, your chances of head injury are, are higher, you know, something like that um, is important. Do you know what you've made me think of? So I was, a, uh, oh, I was just like doing that awful thing where you sometimes go through social media and I came across this woman who, um, she was, um, in a, in a wheelchair, she had no use of her lower half and, but she was ripped. <laughs> and I was like, what is wrong with you? That's amazing. And her tummy was so strong and because of her using her chair and everything, but I think other exercises, yes, yeah, she was just so flipping strong. And I just thought, oh my goodness, I have no excuse. <laughs> like, <laughs> she looks, I mean, we're all different. There are different reasons why people can't, you know, do certain things, especially, you know, mental health and things. But still, I just thought it was amazing to see that she had done that, you know, and I actually broke my foot recently and I went to, oh, I'm sorry. yeah, it was joyful in two places. Oh dear. And I did say to the doc, I was like, mate, I can't go out and do my crazy walks. I go walking for like literally two and a half hours sometimes. And oh yeah, I don't really know. Just, you know, just wait for it to get better. And then I thought afterwards, there must be exercises that you can do because people like the lady that I mentioned do lots of top half exercises, don't they? So I think there are things we can all do. It's just a case of finding finding these exercises, you know? And, and prioritizing them too, right? Or just understanding that those kinds of lifestyle things can make a difference down the line, right? Um, just even just knowing that there are things you can do to you know, keep your brain as healthy as possible. You know, avoiding smoking, sorry, I should have said that one very early on, don't, don't smoke, right? um that's a that's a big one as well tobacco and cannabis like sort of and cannabis would they are they uncleaned cannabis i don't know what term is but are they likely to have a negative impact upon cognitive function well yeah you know and, and again it's it's I, I i'm mainly talking about tobacco but you know i i, I do know that there are some people who smoke a fair amount of cannabis but but you know the idea is that it you know we often think about oh tobacco that's bad lung cancer, things like that. But actually what smoking does is it actually really, um, it really affects your blood vessels. Okay. So, um, and blood vessels are what provides your brain with its blood supply. Right. Um, and so we can definitely see people, you know, who've smoked for a long time, you know, they're at higher risk for strokes, right. Which increases your risk for dementia. They're at higher risk for, um, heart attacks, things like that. But even the small blood vessels that feed the brain, we know that if they're not healthy, um, that can affect your cognitive function. So, um, that's, you know, one very easy thing easy not to start smoking you know a little harder to quit but but important you know that that is one of the most important things you can do to keep your brain to keep your brain healthy and even if it's just one few cigarette like one less cigarette per week or something and if you just bring it down i think a bit like i, I was not that i have a real excuse but i was saying to somebody recently what if i just start doing one sit up a day one and you go over the, a year that's 365 yeah <laughs> yeah you know i would never go that far but yeah that's a lot right so like you were saying i think in the beginning it's little tiny steps to improve small things not just how you feel but your overall life expectancy sometimes yeah. small things over time they add up thank you so much for being with us alice it's been a real pleasure talking to you <laughs> thanks for having me tori thank you so very much to alice for giving us straightforward instructions which are simple as well on how people can preserve their brain function for as long as possible.